now we are going to jump uh, to Sweden and um, to the next speaker, Kaisa Halberg from the KTH. She is the project coordinator of Inclustem at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, in Sweden. And she was a postdoctoral researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute 2019, from 2019 to 2021. She holds a PhD degree in African Studies for the University of Ghana and a master's degree in political science from Uppsala University in Sweden. Her research interests turn towards the future as she studies youth, uh, migration, integration, higher education, and lifelong learning. Thank you very much for being with us, Kaisa, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Cathy. Good morning, all. Uh, and thank you, Katarina, for very interesting uh, presentation. So now we jump north. I'm talking to you from uh, a cloudy Stockholm um, and I represent uh, KTH Royal Institutes of Technology, um, which has grown to become one of Europe's leading technical and engineering universities. And we are Sweden's largest technical research and learning institution, home to students, researchers and faculty from around the world. Uh, the five KTH campuses in Greater Stockholm uh, gather more than 13,000 full-time students. 35% of them are women, uh, over 1,700 PhD students, 33% of them are women, and approximately 3,600, uh, if you convert it, full-time employees. I think we're about 5,000 uh, heads. Um, and as Cathy mentioned, I work with several projects at KTH, all who center on reskilling and lifelong learning. Um, in the Inclusive project, I'm the project's coordinator. Um, and um, I think we have mentioned it, but Inclusive is a training program for uh, rapid inclusion of refugees leading to employment uh, at STEM universities in Europe. And TU Berlin and Katarina is, is part of the project. Um, Unfortunately, I don't hold the same competence as her, so uh, my presentation will not be kind of comparable with hers. Rather, I thought um, I'll touch on kind of strategies that I thought were interesting that have been employed in Sweden on um, improving um, the situation of academic recognition. As we have heard, it's kind of a, a wicked problem. People come from all kinds of backgrounds uh, in all kinds of situations, all kinds of uh, levels of studies um, and how to include them uh, both in our societies and importantly in our um, universities have been a challenge and I'll kind of use uh, one of the other projects that I'm also involved in as an example of a, a way of dealing with, with um, academic recognition as, as a problem. Let's see if I can do this. Yes, do you still see my screen? Is it working? Good, great, because I can also see my notes. So this worked out fine <laughs> in the end. So um, as we have touched upon uh, during the um, early 2010s, ongoing conflicts worsened in many parts of the world and a large number of people were forced to flee from the war in Syria, but also from armed force conflicts elsewhere. Many came to Europe to seek asylum and in 2015, um, the influx of refugees also escalated in our part of the world. Sweden was one of the European countries that opened its borders and we accepted 163,000 refugees. Um, and among them, there was of course a large proportion who in the past had been university employees, they were professors, teachers, administrative staff, but also students. Um, about a quarter had completed or interrupted post-secondary studies and thus constituted an important resource um, for the provision of competence in Swedish society. So already at the end of 2015, uh, the difficult refugee situation was noticed by the Swedish universities. Um, and they have since then intensified their development work to make it easier for new um, arrivals. Um, for graduates and students to take part in academic education in Sweden. Um, and I thought it was interesting to share this um, table here from 2020, uh, where uh, refugee students to Sweden came from. And if you see the people who apply for 
um, academic recognition of their certificates in higher education. Um, the top five countries are India, Iran, Syria, Turkey, and United Kingdom. And on uh, other levels, Syria, Iran, Iraq is at the top. And I'm sure this is similar to, to many other countries. Um, the national development work has been coordinated through um, Sveriges Universitets and Högskoleförbund, SUHF, um, which in English is the Association of Swedish Higher Educational Institutions. Um, in February 2016, they appointed a working group for refugee issues with broad representation. Um, and a woman called Cecilia Kristersson, who's now um, the vice chancellor of Malmö University as chairperson. The working group's work and positions um, have been repeated during the course of the assignment of this group and presented to the federal assembly. Um, so, th so this organization organizes all of the universities in Sweden, or a, a majority of the universities in Sweden, I should say. Um, and they have had uh, dialogues with relevant authorities. So it's, I think it's an important note that the universities themselves have recognized this is an issue and have organized around not just academic recognition, but the situation for refugees at large um, in universities. Um, and they say that there is no doubt that newly arrived graduates are an untapped resource uh, for Swedish society and that they represent a valuable supplement of competence um, available for the Swedish labor market for many years to come. And feel that for a long term perspective, it's important that uh, higher education and the academic sector uh, serves as a key of promoting the construction of stable societies uh, in the war torn countries as well. Um, and I will talk about uh, their work, um, the SOHF work around refugees in a moment. Uh, but I just wanted to mention also that uh, the Swedish Council for Higher Education, UHR, um, are represented both in SOHF, um, but they also um, are the Enicnaric Office for Sweden. Um, so they are in, in charge of uh, the evaluation process for. Uh, individual um, students who want to, um, or graduates who want to um, have their uh, certificates um, reviewed and um, used in Sweden. And I think similarly to Norway, that we heard example from the first meeting, Sweden is not part of the Council of Europe European Qualifications Passport for Refugees, the EQPR. But we have our own system. Um, and this evaluation process you can see in this table and it's, it's not my field of expertise, uh, but basically it's, it's based on um, study documentation provided where uh, authenticity is checked as far as possible. Um, and in the, in the system, they first check that all documentation has been um, sent and only when you have sent everything, the application is complete and can be reviewed. Uh, it's done online. Um, for the qualification to be approved, the school or higher education institution that issued it uh, must be recognized by the country in which it's based. So there we have processes of checking uh, that and then we check the autism. UHR checks a document's authenticity. Um, and might also contact authorities for further uh, information. And Sweden has been performing evaluations since the 1980s and have a large library of reference material from previous cases, which I think is important in here. And through the Enicnaric, we cooperate with offices that have similar tasks in other countries. Um, and then at the end, uh, in the recognition statement, we describe the foreign qualification, where you studied, what degree you have, how long you studied, and we compare it to um, a Swedish qualification. And if there are major differences between the foreign qualification and the Swedish comparison, uh, we might 
UHR might not give full recognition or they will re reject the recognition of qualifications. Uh, the work uh, with evaluating and recognizing foreign qualifications is based on the Lisbon Recognition Convention that we also have talked about. Uh, the convention means that ratifying countries will recognize each other's qualifications unless there's a substantial difference between foreign qualifications uh, for which recognition is sought and the corresponding qualifications in the host country. So individuals can uh, use this, uh, but similarly to uh, what Katharina said about Germany, uh, we also have... Um, um, Salma can help No. So sorry, I have a child that is homesick. <laughs> now, now I'm back. Um, I said similarly to to um, uh, to Germany, um, universities are in the end responsible for for admitting. But we have also, similar to, to Germany, a uh, centralized admission system, not just for foreign students, but for everyone. Um, so that means that time-wise, there might be a challenge because it's only when you have applied and the university has gotten your, your paperwork that the um, um, process can start to, to look through your documentation. So there might be a time um, situation here. So today I wanted to uh, share with you Kind of findings from two different reports uh, that I can of course share with you uh, if you're interested afterwards. Um, but there is the refugee group report from SUHF uh, from 2020, where I think they had some interesting findings on um, the situation in Sweden for refugees in higher education. Um, and then from the project that I've been part of here at KTH uh, that um, addressed newcomers. Um, and offered them a reskilling program in software development. Um, we have just reported our project as well. So I thought it's an example of how um, one particular um, education program dealt with academic recognition. And then I wanted to conclude on some, some key takeaways uh, from, from Sweden on academic recognition for refugees and maybe strategies for, for dealing with this complex uh, problem. Um, so I spoke about uh, SUHF and uh, the constitution of a group to um, kind of map the situation for refugees in higher education. Um, what they started doing was to conduct a survey of higher education institutions activities associated with uh, refugees. Um, And um, with the report that I talked about, the working group concludes its mission. And then the work was carried out between 2016 and 2019. Um, and it contains a number of recommendations for government authorities and the higher education sector. Um, um, and I spoke to a few of, of the people who uh, compiled the report. I mentioned Cecilia Christensen, who was the head of the uh, the group, uh, who is now at Malmö University, but also Jan Talian, the at Högskolan Best, um, to to get some insights. And um, if the dates would have worked out, maybe they would have um, addressed you today. But I think I can take some some of the highlights from from them to report. Um. So out of the first um, um, mapping activity they did, um, they asked higher educational institutions if they have identified legislation that are barriers to the work with the, the target group. And they grouped the responses as follows. And we can see here that um, um, majority of the institutions that responded have a methodology and system for working with documented education and qualifications, whether completed or incomplete, as well as for other forms of education and work experience. 
Uh, somewhat fewer respondents state that they have created systems for working with education that are not documented and other informal learning. Eight institutions state they have some form of increased guidance due to the refugee situation. And these uh, increased measures often include working with Arbetsförmedlingen, um, um, the the office for uh, labor in Sweden, and uh, asylum seeker accommodation, for example. So here, I think also just like Katarina mentioned, sometimes the the barriers are also external to to higher education, and um, so that's kind of the um, initial states. And other um, issues that were brought up by the universities at that point, so early on in the process uh, for access and eligibility. Um, there was an idea that language, um, the requirement for equivalent of Swedish step three for general eligibility, um, whether or not it was necessary for the subject being studied was a hindrance. Uh, the access inquiry is producing a new proposals regarding access to higher education, so it becomes barriers to new arrivals in the form of merit ratings. Um, a student's right to credit transfers from other, other higher education um, or work experience is good, but it excludes informal learning. Um, so that's a problem in the higher education ordinance. Um, there's also the issue of tuition fees that were reinstated in Sweden, Swedish universities for third country citizens um, back in 2011, I believe. Um, it becomes a, a barrier, of course, for welcoming asylum seekers to education um, and kind of increases the uncertainty about measures for asylum seekers, um, especially when it comes to application fees. Um, so even early on in the process. And the university has also found problems in um, recognition and validation. Um, sometimes um, highlighting the, the problem with legitimacy within the university. And here it comes again that um, you have one institution in charge of, of uh, uh, validation but then the universities also have to um, agree to, to that document. And the problem of timing that the validation process cannot begin before admission. Uh, at that time, the validation process was also not adequately tested with unclear rules for prior learning as well. Um, when they concluded, so that, that was from the initial part of the report, when they uh, concluded the, um, the report in 2020, um, the validation work that they had been doing uh, through the work with real competence in the project RECO, uh, universities have significantly proved overall capacity and ability to carry out assessments of knowledge where formal grading and examination documents are missing. Uh, however, for effective and safe validation work, university and university council regain supporting and unifying function that the authority had under the RECO projects, which were carried out from uh, for just two years, 2016 to 2018. Um, and um, the group suggested that um, the work during the projects was were followed up. Um, and for this work to be able to follow up uh, and carried out systemically with quality and with a relevant scope, uh, it also necessitates uh, resources added to universities. Um, they also um, were concerned about um, linking refugee rights to higher education to lifelong learning. It's not just uh, maybe the ones that were students at the time that need higher education, but also maybe reskilling efforts or um, um, even Swedish citizens need to be reskilled um, from time to time now when we live in a knowledge society where we have to kind of focus on lifelong learning. It's becoming more of a, um, a target for higher education in Sweden. 
Um, there was a concern that residence permits necessita necessitates work rather than studies. So it's like you will not be able to um, get a permanent residence permit unless you can show that you have uh, a job, uh, which means that even academics um, who could be, for instance, going into a PhD program might then uh, choose a different path, which is not necessarily good for individuals or for the host country. Um, and the possibility to start complementing the utbildning that I, I'm not sure if it's the right translation to say bridge programs, but um, sometimes you just have a small part left of your um, education and can that be um, met in the right fashion uh, was a concern from the working group on, on refugees. And I, I'll conclude on, on this kind of in the end, but I just think it's interesting that um, it was the universities that organized themselves and created a, a working group on these issues and um, thoroughly mapped the situation within themselves to see best practices and to see what work had been carried out and almost acted like a, um, an activist group to, to push for changes and many of them have um, or are slowly um, coming. So many of these suggestions are being um, met and seen um, on higher levels as well. So that's kind of a, a national level strategy of, of dealing with the improving the situation for academic re recognition for refugees in Sweden. Now I also wanted to talk about a more local um, um, a local example of how you can work with this or how we have worked with it uh, in Sweden. Um, so the Software Development Academy um, was a program that was kind of also set up uh, as a response to the uh, refugee crisis in 2015-2016. Uh, the program started in 2017 and ran for four years. Um, and it was initiated by academics at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Um, And um, the program focused on removing challenges for entry into the job market. And two staff members from KTH contacted a CEO from a um, just launched recruitment company that focused on finding work for high potential foreign born people who had recently immigrated into Sweden. And in April 2016, they set up a joint venture and applied for funds to develop and test a model for rapid training of foreign born people. And in the spring of 2017, the Software Development Academy, SDA, was established. Um, and the um, reskilling program was both um, a testing bed for um, interesting pedagogy and thinking about how, how quickly can you uh, teach uh, a new topic. So within it, we challenge traditional academic models for education. Um, and it targeted professionals with various backgrounds um, and uh, trained them to be software developers. Some of them had IT backgrounds, but um, some of them also came from other engineering fields or um, sociologists, marketing people. Um, the idea was that you should have um, um, an academic degree to join the program, but that wasn't the focus on the uh, admissions, um, and I'll go into the uh, the process in the next slide. Um, but the whole idea of the content for the program was that it should be an accelerated, data supervised, and skill oriented education that was tailor made. Um, and there was also a job matching program um, attached to it, um, run by this uh, recruitment uh, company. Um, and the program developed a learning experience platform um, and was lasting over 15 weeks. It was very intense with 550 study hours. Um, the first batch was 24 participants in 2017, but now when we are complete with the project, 350 individuals have passed through the, the program. And, and a majority of them, I think, um, 
last number we had was 83% for um, employed in the sector um, afterwards. And now I'm not sure how well you can kind of see the, the process of how we um, um, recruited for the, the program, but it's the second uh, square here in the flow charts in the left corner. Um, and the, the idea here was that although we advertised for people who had a university degree that wasn't uh, um, looked at more in detail, but rather uh, we carried out interviews um, and tests. So it was more like a screening um, and we were looking for motivation to be part of the program and um, skills that were needed um, instead of looking at the actual qualifications or certificates. So it's a way of, of bypassing the um, academic recognition um, hurdle, so to speak. And the downside of that um, is that they, the program was outside of the university system. They got a certificate in the end, but I mean, it's not recognized within the, um, the official university um, structure. So the aim of the SDA project was to design and pilot a short education program where foreign born people could be trained to become more employable. Um, and we were thinking that the rapidly expanding Swedish IT sector where the demand for more personnel, um, where the demand was high was a good place to, um, to explore. Um, the 14 week intensive training course, um, in software development was for participants from diverse educational and cultural backgrounds. Um, and the first iterations were more like pilots and then we developed them. And um, in later iterations, uh, we also went online and were able to recruit from, from all of Sweden, also outside of Stockholm. Uh, because of the work intensive nature of the rapid training program, the assumption was that um, the participants needed to be highly motivated and ha have some kind of higher level educational training. Um, and with people with these prerequisites, it would be possible to carry out this intensive training uh, program in such a short time. Um, we could also see from desk research that many foreign born people uh, were unemployed in Sweden or had jobs that were not fitting their educational level. Um, and in addition, the discussion in society about solutions um, meant that uh, there was a strong argument for uh, trying this type of program out. Um, Yes, I, th I think I don't need to go into all the um, details here in the interest of time, uh, but maybe to look at some participants um, and their reflections, uh, their reflections on the impact of the program. Um, here I chose um, one participant from Syria and one from North Macedonia um, and, and their reflections. Um, the first one reflects on the processes relevant um, to the world of tech. So also thinking that she's educated now for a world of tech, not just for Sweden. So she says, most useful for me was learning about agile methodology, which is used in almost all development companies. SDA also introduced the latest updates in tech world and taught us how to deal in teams, which I find really valuable thing. The second, um, testimony compares the job seeking situation to earlier when she did not um, have the experience of this reskilling program. I have easily landed jobs and clients with my new skills, which wasn't the case when I applied for jobs before. KTH on the CV does change a lot in the approach, but I also gained the confidence, which might be the base of the confidence I have now to pursue my dream. Um, 
So here she also kind of mentioned that having KTH on your resume means a difference. It's kind of uh, uh, putting a Swedish stamp on your CV, which might, might be very important. But then um, I just want to stress that it was not an official academic recognition because they were not ad admitted to the university system per se, but this was an external uh, course. Um, so much have improved in refugee matters in Sweden over the past, past five years, uh, which, for example, a better adapted regulatory framework, uh, but important issues um, still remain. Uh, there's still a great need to better include refugees in higher education in Sweden. I think it's important to kind of link it to integration. That's the, the end goal is um, wants people to be feel at home and be integrated in our societies. And this is kind of one path of, of getting there. Um, I wanted to show you two examples of academic activism, if you want, that led to improvements and uh, better national regulation. I think the SDA program, although it hasn't changed uh, regulations, it kind of gave an example of how you can work with uh, refugees in a very productive way that leads to employment. Maybe connecting back to was it Ian's question there about what, what programs should we encourage uh, refugees to take? Um, and I think this is an example of, um, we, we, you don't just focus on the skill, but also on the integration with the job matching. Uh, part of the program as well. Um, we can also see from, from um, both these examples that many times refugees, especially if they're not doc documented, they fall between chairs. Nobody's really responsible for um, helping them. The universities are looking for uh, people who can fit into their systems um, and they are often under time pressure um, to also do the admissions. Um, and we can see that initiatives that bypass academic recognition uh, many times have done well. SDA is one example. Um, there's also another example of during the COVID times where uh, people who claimed to have um, nursing degrees uh, were hired on as assistant nurses uh, because of the need was so great and it was kind of quick to see who who had the experience and who did not. And of course, most people who claim to have a nursing degree um, and have worked in, in uh, hospitals have done so. Um, I think it's, it's also important to see these, these things. So um, the urgency for refugee inclusion has also uh, reduced uh, since 2015, 2016. A lot of people were passionate then about solving the issue. Um, then we have seen that uh, the issue is no more discussed so much, unless this year uh, with the refugees uh, inflow from Ukraine. Although, just as for, for Germany, the expected numbers were smaller than we expected here. And I think um, I spoke to one colleague here at KTH about um, um, how we were able to better accommodate the refugees from Ukraine, both built on um, of the fact that they uh, were part of the directive that they could stay in Sweden for a year, so it's easier to, um, to accommodate them, uh, but also all the learnings that have been done for the last uh, five years. And I think we, we talked about in the Inkistem project to, to do the next course about how um, Ukrainian students have been included and I think that would be a, a good idea. And I think KTH also has um, examples on that, but maybe that's for a different day. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kaisa. Um, are there questions, things you want to ask to Kaisa? No? Yeah. Ian? Sorry to be the person who is asking questions, and I and no, I no, realize no. and I realize That's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I realize if I what if I was here last time, I might have this answer. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't attend the the earlier sessions. But if somebody is a refugee in Sweden, they have to pay tuition fees as per an international student. They can't be counted as a uh, 
because as far as I understand, if you are a refugee somewhere, you should be treated as if you, if you have refugee status, not in a refugee-like situation, you should be treated as if you were, uh, for all intents and purposes, a Swedish citizen or a citizen of that country. So I wonder what's the legal thing there? Shouldn't students be allowed, shouldn't refugee students be given the same rights as a Swedish student applying to university? Yes, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert on this, but ideally that's how it should work. But since we also do have fees for foreigners, it becomes kind of a, um, just a little bit complex because it also then depends on what the student's uh, legal status is and if they want to declare what their legal status is. Um, I think we've spoken about it earlier. Uh, students want to be students. They don't always want to be seen as refugees. And I think that's maybe part of um, why this was flagged uh, in these reports as, um, as a problem um, that is, is not um, clear beyond doubt <laughs> where they fall. So uh, I hope that most of the time this is not an issue um, and I, I don't have numbers, but, but I would guess that that is the reason that um, uh, it also depends on how you enter the system. Um, and if you want to kind of um, fly above the radar and not be seen as a refugee student, but just as a student, you might then encounter that problem. Thank you. Yes, Abdallah, please go. Yeah, um, good morning from my side from Berlin. Um, thank you, Kaiser, for the presentation. I had the question which you, like you mentioned, but maybe I didn't get totally, and it would be interesting for me to see how the situation in Sweden is. Um, in the context of your work, like you said, or like you said in part of the presentation that the um, refugee or the war crisis in Ukraine now has somehow brought back the issue on the table. Um, in comparison to 2015, 2016, do you notice or can you have like, give me an impression maybe, is it like now for Ukrainian refugees easier somehow in com compared to the other refugees? Uh, is the legislation different? Is the recognition faster, different? Like this might be interesting for me. Thank you. I hope I did it yes, clearly. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. I think it's a very important question. Um, and, um, the way I understood it when I spoke to um, our person at KTH who's in charge of admissions uh, was that she mentioned that it's uh, easier for Ukrainian um, refugee students in several ways. Um, first of all, she said there is um, kind of an understanding from previous um, times, from the, especially from when the Syrian refugees came, uh, that um, refugees can be well educated and uh, we should do what we can to help them out. And there are now networks also, like for instance, the refugee group in the SUHF um, association in Sweden. So there are ways of um, networking and learning from each other's best practices. So I think that's one way. I think the refugee directive that allows uh, refugees to stay, you don't have to worry about your um, kind of residence status is another thing that is very different for the Ukrainian um, students and then I think it's um, also the the fact that they are recognized as uh, European um, and I think this has been discussed quite a lot that uh, there has been like a different um, um, tone in the discussion around Ukrainian refugees unfair as that is but that also have made it um, easier for Ukrainian refugees like they would be more um, legitimate refugees in a way. And I mean, I'm not saying I, I subscribe to this. I think it's terrible, <laughs> I think it's hard, but, but it has made it easier for Ukrainian students to, to enter the system. I feel like those things in, in combination. Um, at the same time, the numbers have not been uh, up to what we expected. So I, I think there still are barriers, but maybe there are other barriers. Maybe there are psychological or economic or um, or otherwise, maybe people are hoping to return quicker and not um, establishing themselves. I'm, I'm not sure what, what it is, but from, from the KTH experience, I was surprised that the numbers were quite low, just a handful of students from Ukraine. I hope I responded to your question. Thank you very much for let this give me uh, some idea how does yeah, it work, yeah. how is it like? But, but, but as I said, I hope that we'll, um, Susanna and, and I have started talking about doing the next uh, 
course, a bit more targeted about the experience of um, Ukrainian refugees into our systems. So, so you might get more information from more knowledgeable people next time. <laughs>